this event. And uh, um, I'd like just to spend a very few words uh, to um, say that we are very glad that we are uh, have been able to go through um, this cycle of seminars quite successfully, that many students have shown their interest in onomastics. And today we uh, have the honor of uh, having with us uh, Professor Ian Tent, uh, who is uh, real, a, a, a point of reference as far as toponyms are concerned. He has taught at several universities, Sydney, uh, Fiji, uh, Macquarie, and um, he has published extensively in the fields of uh, uh, linguistics, uh, social linguistics, uh, um, onomastics, especially place names, uh, um, providing uh, really very bright insights uh, uh, from a theoretical point of view. So uh, I'd like to thank him for uh, for uh, offering us uh, the gift of uh, his presentation and uh, would like to leave him the floor. Um, thank you, Ian, for being with us. Oh, you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. So, uh, can you uh, see... You can share your screen, yeah. You can see, you can see my presentation here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Right. Um, a lot of people ask me uh, what I study as an academic and a linguist. And when I tell them that I study place names, they usually are quite incredulous. And some of the questions they ask me or their comments are, what is there to study about place names? And apart from what they might mean and where they come from, what else is there to say about them? And what is what is that? Uh, why is it an academic subject at all? And some of these questions are understandable from a point of view of a of a layperson. But I have even received these questions from academic colleagues. So these questions have inspired me to start writing uh, a monograph uh, on on place names and it's entitled um, Understanding Place Names. So what I'm about to present is a, a, a slight taste uh, of, of what I deal with in, in my uh, forthcoming book. So before we go on into looking at place names themselves and what how important they are in um, in society, we need to know what a place name is. So the formal name of a place name is a toponym. And it's very important to understand that a toponym is a place and its name, not a name for places. So for example, Heidelberg uh, in Germany and Heidelberg in South Africa, and there's a Heidelberg in Melbourne as a suburb, and a Heidelberg in California, and Texas, and Mississippi, and Kentucky. Now, these are all different place names, not the same name appearing in different places. Of course, they share the same name form, and that's an important word to remember as a name form, but they are all distinct toponyms because they, are, they all have their unique locations and histories, they, they may have a connection to each other. Of course, they're all named after the Heidelberg in Germany. Um, so when we see a toponym in a gazetteer, a gazetteer is a list of place names in a region, and uh, the, uh, the place name in a gazetteer will have its... Uh, its coordinates, its latitude and longitude. Uh, and when we write the history of that place name, we want to know uh, why it was named, thus who named it, where it is, etc. So if we had a single entry for Heidelberg in a gazetteer or a dictionary of place names, 
It would be very much like having a single entry for someone called John Howard that represented all the John Howards in a dictionary of, of biography or in Wikipedia. And clearly, we can't have that. So where does topon toponymastics or, or toponymy, if you like, the study of place names fit in to, uh, to the academic discipline? Well, it's a, it's a side um, discipline of onomastics, which is the study of names which is, is a, a side discipline of linguistics or the study of language. So having established that, we can now look at how toponyms play a role in society. So firstly, I have a list here and I'll discuss some of these um, in my presentation. Not all of them, of course. So place names are very important for personal identity, community identity, and national identity. They also form parts of names of businesses, trade names, product names. We'll see some examples later on. But they are also important for national statistics and census data and property rights and cadastra. Cadastra is uh, we have cadastral maps that show um, boundaries, property boundaries. So we have to know which property belongs to who and properties and um, uh, councils and uh, towns are all on these maps. So we have to know where the borders are of these particular uh, places. So, and also we need to know about place names for urban and regional planning, sustainable environment development and conservation. Of course, logistics for postal delivery and services. Without place names, we wouldn't know where to deliver things. Disaster relief, security and defense, peacekeeping, search and rescue operations, tourism, communications and media services like the news and weather reports, possession issues. I'll just be discussing that a little bit further along. Uh, geopolitics and post-colonial naming that's extremely important. And genealogical research, if you want to find out where your ancestors came from, of course, place names play a very important role in that. And historical research, settlement patterns and language change. I'll give some examples of that. And of course, place names also honor people and events. Uh, quite a lot of towns and cities are named after people honoring those people. And of course, uh, place names, probably their most important uh, function is to f navigation, to find our way. An example of this is uh, topogenic uh, songlines. Now, songlines are uh, used by the Australian Indigenous people to find their way from one part of the country to the next. And they can sing their way through the country by naming places in the right order and they can find them themselves, uh, to, they can find that their way friend of mine uh, was traveling from the Northern Territory down to Adelaide by bus with a group of school children. And there was a, a, a lady accompanying them. And she told my friend, oh, um, over the next hill, there will be a pile of rocks and there'll be water there. And he said, have you been here before? And she said, no, never. But I know the song lines. I know the names of all the spots along the way. And I can find my way wherever I want to go. So that, that's an example of uh, wayfinding and navigation. This is very important. And as these two images are from uh, the Ukraine. And you'll notice the one on the left shows that there is no sign there at all. And the one on the right ha is in Russian and it, it's a message to, to the Russian invaders, go F yourself and go F yourself again, and go F yourself in, in Russia. And this is a typical 
um, uh, strategy used by soldiers to take down place name uh, place name uh, signs to confuse the enemy of where to go. So it makes it more difficult for them to find their way. So I thought that was a rather nice contemporary example of that. This was this technique was used in World War One and World War Two all the time. So most areas that I've just discussed, uh, uh, pl uh, toponymy plays a very, very close, um, ex uh, inextricably linked uh, role in all those. So in history, language management, uh, archaeology, uh, a PhD student of mine did a study of uh, place names in the Arabian Peninsula and he showed that by looking at the place names there of very small uh, locations that the whole area had been uh, occupied by uh, people uh, from quite far away and this was never known until my student uh, showed that uh, these place names uh, were remnants of, and of um, these people who had lived there. So in cartography, geography, marketing and environmental science, and of course in linguistics, in diachronic and synchronic linguistics. So toponymy plays a, a very important role in all of these, and we'll have a look at some of these. So first of all, in marking identities. So your own personal identity is linked very closely to the place where you come from and the language where you come from. So the, lang the, the language that you speak, uh, the, the place name that you come, come from will be in the language that you speak. And so, you know, you're often, often asked, um, where were you born? Where does your family come from? Where do you live, etc." So these are important uh, issues in personal identity. And of course, uh, Place names are a source for family names. So we have these Italian, uh, Di, uh, Genova, Milani, Napoli, Napolitano and Romano. And of course, English place names, Bathurst, Camden, Hastings, and of course, the late Queen's name, Windsor. Um, we have, of course, the famous, paint, uh, famous artist Rembrandt. His real name was Rembrandt van Rijn, meaning Rembrandt of the Rhine, the Rhine River. Josef von Sternberg and the former uh, French um, president Giscard d'Estaing. D'Estaing is a is a place um, uh, in France. So these all these people take their surnames, their family names from place names. So which therefore is part of their identity. So, but place names are also important as markers of community and national identity. So, uh, sports teams, oh, I've got a little slight, slight spelling error there. Uh, local sports teams and national sports teams are, are very, very important to place names play there. They also, they uh, are used in reclaiming national identity. So, in this last year, we've seen that uh, Kiev was always pronounced as uh, Kiev uh, before the Russians invaded. So the Ukrainians said, no, we don't want the Russian pronunciation. We want our Ukrainian pronunciation. So now when you hear the news, you will generally hear news readers say Kiev rather than Kiev. Um, and other examples are Burma, which changed its name to Myanmar, and Rangoon was changed to Yangon after 2016. So the, the uh, Burmese people uh, wanted to reclaim their national identity by changing those names. Other examples include islands that used to be known as Gilbert Islands, and they are now known as the Kiribati, and I Kiribati refers to the to the people of Kiribati. Um, Kiribati is actually their way of saying Gilbert. 
Um, and that they they uh, obtained their independence in uh, 1979, and so the Gilbert Islands changed to Kiribati. The Republic of Turkey very recently has changed the way it spell its spelt, and now um, they want to be known as the Republic of Turkey. This one, the 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 image shows you that. This is a, a, a road sign in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, you'll see that the word London of the name Londonderry has been blocked out because the Irish people want to get rid of the London part. And they say, well, our name for the place is Derry. So all these road signs in Northern Ireland, you'll see the word London crossed out or, or, or whited out or blacked out. So it's, it's, it's a way of reclaiming national identity. Um, other examples are East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, Siam, Thailand, Portuguese Timor to East Timor to Timor-Leste, the Ellis Islands, which are now known as Tuvalu, the New Hebrides are now known as Vanuatu and the people are called Ni Vanuatu, and Southern Rhodesia became Rhodesia and then Zimbabwe Rhodesia and then later on Zimbabwe. So all these names changed in order for, for the countries to establish or re-establish their identities. Some, some very uh, uh, pointed examples in Russia, St. Petersburg was used up until 1914, and then it became Petrograd from 1914 to 24, Leningrad from 1924 to 91, and then back to St. Petersburg from 1991. And it's the same with Stalingrad, which is now known as Volgograd. And another example of a city that has changed its name after the fall of, of uh, South Vietnam. So Saigon became Ho Chi Minh City, Ho Chi Minh being named after the city being named after their leader, Ho Chi Minh. So it honor, honors and commemorates that, that person. Um, another way is um, for nations to acknowledge identity is, there, is to acknowledge indigenous toponyms. So New Zealand was named by the Dutch. And in recent years, we've seen New Zealanders referring to their country as Aotearoa. And you'll often see on, on place names, New Zealand slash Aotearoa. And I suspect in future, in the not too distant future, those two names will be swapped around and it will be Aotearoa New Zealand. So a lot of my friends in New Zealand are already saying Aotearoa New Zealand or just simply Aotearoa. But that naming is an ongoing discussion and um uh, but i'm sure that in in time new zealand will be known internationally as aotearoa uh Ayers rock in uh northern territory in australia was uh known after a while uh later on uh, in the 1990s i think uh it was known as Ayers rock uluru and then it was changed to uluru Ayers Rock, and now it's just known as Uluru. So we can see that's the picture of Ayers Rock, and we can see an old uh, picture of a, of a road sign on the left saying Ayers Rock, 189 miles. And then later on, Uluru Ayers Rock, and now the road sign just says Uluru. So changing of names will indicate a change of attitude and a, a change of uh, what people see as their personal identity. So this leads us into geopolitics. Um, so territorial disputes are usually closely linked with place naming. So for example, you can see the, the, the diagram down below. Uh, it, it's quite a messy area with all these different countries making claim over uh, the South China Sea. And they all have different names. So uh, South China Sea is named the West Philippine Sea by the Philippines. 
and the Spratly Islands, they're all highly disputed. And most of these islands have at least six names because all these countries lay claim to these, these islands. So other territorial claims in the region are the Senkaku Islands by Japan, uh, which are known as Diao Yu Islands by China and the Diao Yutai Islands in Taiwan. And there's the Sea of Japan that the Japanese call, but the South Koreans call it the East Sea. And the, and the East Sea of Korea, is that's the name that the North Koreans show uh, uh, gave for it. So the Scarborough Shoal in the Philippines, seized by China in 2012, who now call it the Huangbian Island. So uh, when you take possession of a place, you give it a new name. So place names, place naming is universally a primary means for appropriating physical environments. And to name a place is really a, like a symbolic way of, of taking possession of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, so they play a significant, so in history, they play a significant role in the, in the history of a region. Uh, I'll give some examples in a moment because, uh, because place names hardly change. They can reveal how language has changed or how the environment has changed or has been altered. So place names are very, very important. Uh, for for linguistics and also for environmental sciences. Uh, they can reveal settlement and occupation patterns, which can ultimately lead to as contentious issues regarding renaming the claiming of territory as we have just seen. So, but they can, the naming of places also offer insights into the belief and value systems of the name givers. So you can dig quite deeply into uh, lists of place names in a region to get an insight into who named these places and why they named these places, gave these places these names. So they form an integral part of a nation's cultural and linguistic heritage. So it, it's political and social history is revealed through its toponyms. I'll give some examples now. So they're just not labels, but they're reminders of who we are and whence we came. So examples of the importance of place names in history is uh, the areas of Scandinavian occupation in Britain. So these are marked in the yellow and the red uh, the Norse being the red and the Danish yellow. So how do we know that the Danes and the Norsemen occupied these areas in England or in Britain? Well, through the names they gave the settlements in those areas. Uh, and so that's how we have been able to establish the, the exact areas in which uh, the Vikings uh, had their settlements in England or in, in Great Britain. Uh, the Roman Empire is exactly the same. So we know the extent of the Roman Empire, not only because of the uh, history history books that, that were kept, the histories that were kept at the time, but also by the names that the Romans uh, gave to settlements in, in all of these in all of these regions. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, in South Australia, uh, near Adelaide, you will see Adelaide there, uh, there are quite a few German names. And that's because a lot of German immigrants settled in that area and they established the wine growing areas there. So a lot of the uh, wine that's grown in these areas uh, have, have German names. So uh, these names that you can see on the map, 
uh, were established around about the middle of the 19th century. But during the First World War, uh, this map was produced. And this shows you how place names can be politicized because it says here Deutschland über Südaustralien. So this is a map of Germany. Is this a map of Germany or South Australia? So that is sending a, a very, very strong message to whoever sees this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this poster that people are not happy with uh, these German names. Uh, and this, this poster was uh, made in, in, during the First World War. Here's an example of uh, uh, one of those names. You can see that it, uh, Rosenthal from 1849 to 1918, and after that, it was uh, named R Rosedale, which is really quite a transparent um, translation of it, really. It's transliteration, isn't it, really? So it really isn't hiding it, its original German uh, name at all, if you dig deep enough. So if you have a look at the table um, on the left-hand uh, column, you'll see the states of, of Australia and the original number of German names each of those states had. And you'll see that there were 161 German names originally in Australia. And now, uh, after the Second World War, uh, sorry, the First World War, this was a uh, hundred of them were expunged. Uh, some of them regained their names, but not many at all. So you'll see South Australia had 75 German names, but now only has 23 of those left, which is a shame because it, it, it expunges the, 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 the German heritage uh, of South Australia. Now, uh, I said before that place names can place namings can reveal a lot about the sort of the attitude uh, of the namers. I did a study um, back in the early two thousands uh, of on the indigenous place names in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji. So, uh, people often ask me how many Aboriginal or Indigenous place names are there in Australia. And officials told me it would be, it was around about 60%. But I felt that that was not, not quite, not so. These, these were people from naming authorities, from Australian naming authorities. So what I did, I went to the uh, uh, Gazetteer of Australian place names and there were over 300,000 names in this Gazetteer. And I went through every single one of them. Took me months of work. It was quite boring. But I discovered that only just over 28% of Australian place names were actually Aboriginal. And the rest were introduced names, either English or German or whatever. Then I went to the New Zealand Gazetteer. Thank goodness they only had 13,000 names. And I found that 42% were Māori or Indigenous names. And then I went to the Fiji Gazetteer, which has even fewer place names, and found that 97% of the place names there were uh, Indigenous. So what do these figures tell us? Well, they tell us a couple of things. One, the English colonists settlers in Australia had very little regard for Indigenous people and they were treated and still are treated extremely badly. And therefore, this probably accounts for the very low percentage of Indigenous names. It, it is being rectified to some degree. Uh, more and more places are, are being named, uh, uh, given, given Indigenous names, but not enough. The other important thing to realize is that there were over 350 indigenous languages spoken in Fiji at, uh, in Australia at the time and so a lot of the play, a lot of the languages uh, uh, have died out and we don't know 
and the Aboriginal people are very secretive about their knowledge, their cultural knowledge, and they don't like to share it with outsiders, i.e. Europeans, so they keep their place names secret. So that would account for the low percentage. In New Zealand, however, the Māori, uh, there are only two, two forms of Māori spoken, and they were very closely related and they were mutually uh, intelligible. So um, it was a very different situation. And the Māori were also treated with far more respect uh, in, in New Zealand than the Aboriginal people were in Australia. So that would account for the higher percentage of um, Indigenous toponyms there. And in Fiji, of course, uh, Fijian is still uh, the most uh, widely spoken language in Fiji and the Fijians. Uh, in by far the majority in the population. Australia only has about 3% of its population who are Indigenous. So it tells us a number of things. One, the attitude of the namers towards the Indigenous people, and, and two, uh, the linguistic situation and the, um, and the cultural situation and the number of people who, who lived in those areas. So you can see by looking at, at place names, Indigenous versus introduced place names, it, they can tell us a lot about uh, a, a country's history. Um, I also did a study um, on the, the naming practices of the Dutch, English and French prior to Australia's colonisation. And this is uh, the Dutch explorers and the English and the French explorers uh, sailing around the, the coastlines of Australia and naming things. And I have here the following toponym types, names, toponyms that are descriptive, are describing a place, associative. Uh, it could, a place could be called Kangaroo Valley um, because there were kangaroos there. So the kangaroos were associated with the valley. Our current names, our place names are names that uh, indicate something that happened there. Um, evaluative place names were, as you can see, there aren't many of those. And they either that they they actually uh, either gave it a, a positive or a negative name, like Mount Disappointment. A copy, which is a, a copy or a, or a, bo a copying a place name from from back home, and and applying it to to Australia. But the most interesting one are the eponymous place names, and these are the names that are named after, after people or ships, things like that. But you'll notice that the English favoured, tended to favour uh, descriptive place names more so than the English. But when we look at the eponymous place names, um, these, these figures don't really reveal what lies behind them. Although the percentages are quite high, um, when we look at the types of names uh, of the eponymous place names, the following is revealed. So the eponymous place names, those given by the Dutch, were tended to be named after the Dutch East India Company officials. So that is very, very telling because the Dutch East India Company, the only thing that they were interested in was trade. And uh, the Dutch explorers that went around the coastlines of Australia wanted to ingratiate themselves with the VOC officials. And uh, so places were named after that. Now, interestingly, the British favoured naming places after the nobility and political figures once again, wanting to ingratiate themselves with the nobility and political figures. But here is the most interesting bit. The French, who are right in the middle of the, not the Renaissance, the uh, Enlightenment, they named places after scientists, literary figures, philosophers, as well as military and naval figures, but mostly scientists and philosophers. I find that very, very interesting indeed, and that's very telling of, 
of the sort of uh, atti mental attitudes that the French had, and as well as the Dutch and, and the English. So naming places after influential people is a, is a way of establishing a national identity, but also gaining favours with the people back home. Uh, naming places after vessels was more common with the Dutch than the British. And once again, this may be a reflection of their predominantly commercial interests. But also when we look at the period in which the Dutch and the English and the French explored the coastlines of Australia, we see that the Dutch explored the coastline between 1606 and 1756. Now that's before the Enlightenment and, and there main aim was, as, as I said, trade. But the English really started to uh, explore the coastlines from 1770 to 1793, uh, and, and the French from 1768 to 1803. And that is smack bang in the, in the period of the Enlightenment. But the, I don't think the English were as enlightened as the French, uh, because they named their places after royalty and, and, and the nobility. So, so these are very telling, very interesting facts that these place names tell us. Okay, environmental sciences. Um, place names, they can uh, tell us quite a lot about changes in the environment that, uh, that have occurred, either natural or, or human induced. And we can reconstruct the past, but, uh, uh, but distribution of flora and fauna, and we can provide geologists with information about environmental changes. So in New York, there are the following names of, of areas, uh, of, of suburbs in New, New York. Fresh Kills comes from the Dutch killer, which means a riverbed or a water channel. So Fresh Kills doesn't mean fresh kills. It means a fresh, fresh water channel. And Gramercy comes from the Kromarsche, which means a crooked marsh. So Gramercy what used to be a marsh. Of course, it's no longer. Greenwich Village comes from Grunwijk, which means a verdant or green district, and Bushwick, which means uh, uh, a forest district. So these suburb names of New York tell us what used to be there. Uh, another interesting one is Salinas, the town of Salinas in California. And uh, it used to be an area of swamps, which at the end of the summer dried and left white deposit of alkali salt. And the appearance of salt resulted in the name Salinas. Uh, Holland, uh, a lot of people uh, assume that Holland means ho hollow land, but no, it actually comes from Holtland, which means woodland. And it refers to the region just south of Rotterdam and uh, which was heavily forested. But in by 1064, the name was applied to the entire country. Amsterdam is another interesting one. Uh, Amstel uh, Damme actually means the dam on the Amstel River. So here is a, a, a depiction of Amsterdam back in th around about 1300. And the, the red circle shows you where the dam was built. The yellow circle shows you where the dam square is, where the, the royal palace is. And the blue circle shows you what's called the Damrak. And uh, Damrak, I'll show you here, that Damrak means uh, the dam plus reach a straight stretch of water between two bends. So you can see again, the royal palace and, and at, at the dam, um, at the dam square, and the red circle indicates where the original dam was, and uh, the blue circle shows you uh, what the Dumbrak looks like now. The following, this is the picture of what the Dumbrak looks like. This is taken from the dam square, looking towards the central station, railway station, and just in front of the central railway station, you have, you have the waterway. So this whole area used to be a waterway, but it's completely filled in, but it's still called Dumbrak, like the st stretch, of, stretch of water, even though it's not, of course. Uh, 
in Sydney, we have a place called Garden Island, which is a naval uh, base. And you'll see that it's not an island at all anymore. It used to be uh, when Sydney was first settled, uh, a garden was established on that island uh, to grow vegetables. So hence the name Garden Island. Here's a picture of the of the island in 1929. So it's still an island then, but in the meantime, it has it has um, uh, been attached to the mainland. Uh, a couple of other examples. This is a picture of the Miramar Peninsula in Wellington Harbour, in New Zealand. And the Maori name is Motu Kairangi. Motu meaning island, Kairangi meaning wonderful or chief. So you can see that it's not an island at all, but it bears the name Motu. Here's a picture of what Motu Kairangi used to look like some four or five hundred years ago. This is before a massive earthquake took place and there was a, 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 a raising of the land and the island was joined to the mainland. So uh, where uh, this shows that the Maori who actually uh, settled in New Zealand some 900,000 years ago, were present at the time of the earthquake and had given the island in the middle of the harbour there, in the middle of the bay, that name, although it no longer is an island. Another example from New Zealand is uh, Te Roto o Wairewa, uh, or Lake Forsyth. It used to be called Lake Forsyth, but now it has its Maori name. And the yellow arrow there points to where it is. It's just south of Christchurch. So Y means river, Rewa means lifted up. So it actually means the, the lake of the lifted up water. And here's a picture of it. And Again, it, the Māori must have been present when the lake, uh, it used to be a river, but it was blocked off from the sea because the earth, an earthquake came and blocked it off from the sea and raised, raised the water and raised the land. So again, uh, the name indicates some environmental change. This one is probably my favourite one of all. In Fiji, there's a place, there's an island called Tavua, which means burning place. And um, people have often wondered, why was it called the burning place? And it's only in the last 20 or 30 years that geologists have discovered that some 3,000 years ago, this used to be a volcano that it, there is now geological evidence, evidence to show that it was the, the, that the volcano was erupting in about three thousand years ago. Interestingly enough, Fijians occupied Fiji three and a half thousand years ago, so they would have witnessed this island being and called it burning place because of because of the volcano that was there. So now naming things, I'll skip I'll skip through this quite quickly. Uh, of course, we're all aware that product names, eau de cologne, um, and mayonnaise, pawn de vec cheese, Emmental, champagne, Riesling, Pilsner, uh, Gorgonzola, all those names for products, cheeses and, and, and wines, etc., uh, all come from place names. And of course, the EU is very, very keen on maintaining these names and for uh, as European identity and is not very happy when people uh, over the rest of the world, like in, in, in Adelaide, when they make a wine then they call it a Riesling. Uh, the EU is not happy with that at all. Company names, uh, you can see there Amazon, Qantas Airways, uh, Queensland and Northern Territory Air Services. Uh, Toshiba coming from Tokyo and Shiba, Shibaura, 
uh, uh, 3M comes from the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company and so on. Manufactured goods, uh, which are now just uh, plain common nouns, calico, damask, denim, jeans, limousine, Venetian blinds, etc. They all come from place names. Ships and car models. Uh, so ships uh, often have names from the places where they come from. Um, and of course, car names. Um, sports, badminton, rugby, marathon, telemark skiing, and so on. And animal breeds, and the list goes on and on and on. Flora and fauna, of course. Uh, I don't need to go through those. Uh, I'll, I'll send uh, Louisa a, a, a copy of this, and you can go through them at your own leisure. So not only common names, but scientific names as well. Um, so uh, yeah, you can have a look at it in your own at your own uh, time. Viruses and diseases, uh, Ross River fever, Hendra virus, Ebola, uh, Lyme disease, Zerka fever, etc. The um, World Health Organization is doesn't or is recommends that viruses and diseases, infectious diseases, no longer get named after the place where they were first discovered for obvious reasons, because it is not, um, it is not, not good PR for the places uh, where, uh, where those you know, diseases were first, first described. Chemical elements uh, are also come from, from place names. And metonyms. Metonyms are names for a larger a name that you uh, that you apply for a larger concept. So when we say Washington, we're actually meaning the government of the United States, states, or Downing Street, the uh, the British Prime Minister, or the, the British uh, government, or Brussels, the European Union, and Wall Street, the American financial market. Broadway, the American theatre and Hollywood, American film industry and so on. So um, place names also play a part uh, as, as metonyms. So to round off, so the, the place names are, are important to linguistics and psychology because language is patterned or ruled governed systematic behaviour. Without these rules, languages couldn't function or exist, nor could young children learn to speak a language without those rules. So the study of phonetics, phonology, etc., try to describe the rules and systems of language, and thereby they provide these these disciplines provide windows into the workings of the human brain. And studying the structure and formation of place names is part of this and also provides a window into how languages and the human brain works. Um, for this reader's alone, toponymy, I think, is a discipline worth taking seriously. So to round off, science refers to humans as homo sapiens, wise man or person. Linguists often refer to humans as homo locums, meaning speaking man or person. However, I like to refer to humans as homo appellants, naming man or person. Because when we go back to the book of Genesis, second chapter, verse 19 to 20, we read, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave the names to cattle and to the fowl and to the air and to every beast of the field. So it goes back a long, long way how we, how people, human beings, name things. So anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. And grazie. So I'm back. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I hope I didn't go too quickly. Really, really, 
lovely, lively, and thank you for providing this huge window uh, on, on place names. So interesting and so broad. Thank you. So, oh, you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. I've only just uh, scratched uh, the surface. This is so much more. <laughs> you are really mine, a precious mine. Uh, are there any questions? Please don't be shy. Uh, <laughs> please, Profe please Profe Profe Professor Tent will be very, very happy to to answer your question. And I know that you are there uh, feeling a bit shy, but there is no need to be so. No, we don't bite. Don't be shy, Mirko. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and that was brilliant. I mean, oh, I really thank you. enjoyed thank you. The, the, the presentation. I think for the students, that was the perfect introduction to uh, place names. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you could if you could say something about dual names, especially in those contexts that you mentioned, like post-colonial, because that that's also interesting when more than one language is officially recognized in in one. Yeah. Uh, what do, what 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 were you thinking of? What would no? Uh, just maybe uh, just a comment on that for, for the students actually. If right. It's, okay. If it's very if it's very common uh, in uh, in Australia, for example, or in other countries, and uh, what, what, also what is the you know social and cultural and also political implications? Uh, and also maybe that marks. Uh, thank you, Mirko, for your question because that that may mark uh, in some cases a. a kind of a stage towards the change that uh, Ian was showing us at the beginning. And in some other occasions, uh, it's still there. So depending on whether you keep both names, you have, you can see that as a step on the way towards uh, indigenization, so to speak, or... Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily have to occur in post-colonial uh, societies, although it generally does. In the United States, we're finding more and more particularly inappropriate uh, place names um, uh, like squ squaw, tit, uh, whatever, and and the N word. There are a lot of there are a lot of uh, place names that had the N word in Australia. Not far from here, there was actually a mountain called Mount Niggerhead, and that was changed recently to the Jaitamatangs. Uh, but uh, so so the, the inappropriate name was expunged. Um, but the interesting thing is, and this is this is a, a political uh, um, a political issue, on one side of the mountain. There is one group of Aboriginal people who had a name for it. And on the other side of the mountain, there was another group of Aboriginal people who had another name for it. But the Victorian government chose only one side, the name of one side, which has upset the people from the other side of the mountain saying, that's not our, that's not our name for it. So now there is this huge debate going on of whether Jaitamatungs is the right name for that mountain or not. And so this happens all the time in Australia. There's a, um, there's a place uh, that was called the Convincing Ground by one of Australia's uh, famous uh, explorers and first governors, Governor Macquarie. And it was called the convincing ground because that's where there was a massacre of indigenous people uh, and uh, they needed to be convinced of the superiority of the white settlers. So this place was called the convincing ground, but it, it thank goodness it has now changed names. So a lot of inappropriate names are being are being expunged and the appropriate indigenous name uh, put in place instead of it. But uh, as you said, Louisa, that it's it's a process. Once a decision has been made to recognise the indigenous name, 
it, it, it sits side by side with the introduced name. And uh, for a while, uh, the two names will, will coexist. Um, but, but there's usually a lot of opposition to the indigenous name. There was a, there's a, a national park um, in Victoria. It used to be called the Grampians, and now it's called the Gary Word National Park. And again, it was Grampians slash Gary Word, and then Gary Word slash Grampians, and now it's just Grampians. But a lot of the local people there still refuse to use the term Gary word. They want, they want to use the, the, the term Grampians. So, but over time, you know, people will just accept the fact that the indigenous name is used, like Uluru. No one, no one these days uses Ayers Rock. I don't know of anyone who says Ayers Rock. Everyone says Uluru. And so that's on tourist brochures and everything. So it's a slow process, um, but even even in Holland, um, in, in the province of, of Friesland, the, uh, they speak Frisian there, which is probably most most connected to English. It's more like English than Dutch, but the place names there they have Dutch and Frisian place names, and there's a strong movement there to to expunge the Dutch place names and to just have the Frisian place names. Um, like the capital of Friesland, Leeuwarden, is the Dutch name for it, but the Frisians call it Ljauert. And so there's a very strong movement to, to have Ljauert as the, as the name of the place rather than Leeuwarden. And this is connected very strongly with language maintenance too, with the because Frisian now is an accepted language in schools. Um, so language maintenance and place names are, are inextricably linked as well. Yeah. You know, any other questions? <laughs> Did I answer your question, Mirko? Yeah, yeah, that was, yes. I was also thinking about, you know, um, when this, there's dual names are officially recognized and where they are just introduced for uh, like a symbolic purpose for example where i near i, I live in trento northeast italy and uh, uh, it's close to south tyrol where both yep. italian and german names are officially recognized so every place name is in the two languages Whereas yes. where I work in Calabria, um, I mean, the, the only official language is Italian, but there are places where also Albanian, Albarez actually, is used to name uh, places, but that's not, I think, I'm not 100% sure, but that's more symbolic. So you see the, you know, uh, the, 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 the road sign in two languages, but it's not like the, the it's not official, it's just symbolic. That's also yeah. part of the process that you um, exp that you talked about to, towards, you know, recognizing um, languages or uh, yeah, communities speaking those languages. So, yeah, it, it, as you say, it, it probably, it, it does, it certainly does start off as a symbolic gesture. Mm. Um, but, uh, and, and once it catches on, uh, pressure mounts sometimes, uh, and then it becomes official. And then it, um, uh, the naming authorities will actually uh, gazette the new the, the dual name, and then ultimately perhaps even just get rid of the introduced name. So on, in the gazetteer, you'll have a place name with an alternate name, you know, and and they might. Uh, swap over, and then you have an official name. But it it certainly does start off as a as a as a gesture, you know. I was wondering about uh, Albanian names that you mentioned, Mirko, because there are Albanian communities also in Basilicata. Mm. So I was wondering whether uh, any of our students have ever noticed the, or known of uh, double. Uh, place names in uh, such communities. 
I guess no. <laughs> yeah. You know what? Sometimes it happens also with dialect like regional yeah. dialects here in Italy. And it's just a way to, I don't know, probably stress or mark the local identity of that community. So you have the official Italian name, but that also, and usually at least here, they use also different colors for those signs. Like uh, official no, ones no, no. are white, whereas if right. it's something like, uh, yeah, more symbolic, here it should be in, in brown, I guess. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a dynamic thing, you know, the naming of places. and Yeah, yeah. and I was also thinking about uh, um, those, uh, it's not really about, uh, uh, you know, um, geographical places or uh, cities, but it's more about other names, so uh, street names or uh, square names, um, and in Naples there are several examples of that. So there is like an official name, the, the, yep. and then uh, there is the name used by locals, yeah. uh, which I think it's, uh, it becomes a sort of in-group uh, practice as well. So you, you, you call that street that way because that's the way your local community uh, it's yeah. used to doing, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. That reminds me. Heard. Sorry. Sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, that reminds me of um, uh, a, a, a type of toponym called micro toponyms. And they're usually, sometimes they're called field names. And they are only known generally by local people. Yeah. And it's a tiny, it, it could be uh, well, like, like a field and it has a name and it's bec because the field might be, might have belonged to someone and, and that person's name is attached to the field. But just up the road from here is a, uh, is a very windy road that goes up to, up to the tops of the mountains. And all around this area was a huge... Uh, uh, hydroelectric scheme and it took 20 or 30 years to build and lots of they started it after the second world war and lots of migrants from from europe came here after the war lots and lots of italians there are quite a few italians still living in this village this village was actually uh established for this hydroelectric scheme and there are a couple of italian families still living here Although they don't speak a word of Italian anymore, they all speak all speak English. But up the road, there's a little uh, uh, what what do you call uh, area on the side of the road where you can pull off to the side and park, and it's known not widely, but it it was known by all the workers from the hydroelectric scheme as Sally Ann's. Sally Ann was a prostitute who had a caravan who parked the caravan there and she plied her trade from this caravan. And she was always parked at the side of the road there. And so this, this, this little spot is called Sally Ann's. So that's a good example of a micro toponym. <laughs> um, and it, and it, there's, no, there's no sign there or anything like that. Sometimes you do get signs indicating uh, a microtoponym. Uh, there is another one down the road here called uh, Lighthouse Crossing. And there's a sign there because there's a camping ground there saying Lighthouse Crossing Camping Ground. And there used to be a crossing there uh, over the river. And there wasn't a lighthouse there, but there was a house further up the hill. And if you were looking for the crossing at night, you looked for the light from the house and that told you where to go to go to the crossing. So that crossing was called Lighthouse Crossing. But that's the only one I know of that has a sign there. But it's it's unofficial. You'll never find that in any gazetteer. And it's sort of like a very localised sort of a name. But th th they're fascinating. Um, Microtoppings are really interesting. 
I was just I thinking of one uh, that I have been told about in Potenza. That's the main square, and apparently they name it uh, Piazza Polmonite, which means uh, pneumonia square because it's very cold and windy, and so <laughs> that's how they dub it. And <laughs> of course, uh, it seems to be quite uh, a local thing. Um, I I'd like to add something that uh, your uh, entire presentation uh, has pointed to something that I find really fascinating about uh, place names, and it's uh, an, an issue related to uh, you know, what we, uh, a debated issue actually, what we um, usually uh, refer to uh, in linguistic terms as meaning. In yep. fact, all that you have talked about has to do with meanings that are attached to place names, even though they are not lexical meanings in the strict sense of no. a dictionary meaning. Uh, so exactly. to speak. Even though we have come to learn that uh, also for lexical words, uh, um, dictionary meanings may be quite... Uh, kind of limited it's just it's like a gazetteer of, yes. of words so to speak so thank you because it, it's been fascinating also from this point of view yeah 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 we um, there's so much been written uh, for a long long time for for oh going back to Plato uh, 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 about you know the meaning of, of of proper names. Do do proper names have meaning? And many philosophers say no, they don't. They they have a referent, but but no inherent meaning themselves. Like like you say, like a, like a dictionary meaning, you know. So when we uh, it, it, with the Australian National Place Name Survey, uh, to which I, I'm part of. What we're trying to do is to write the biography of all the place names in Australia. We'll never, we'll never finish it because there's, there's over three million place names, and and to, just to study one place name might take weeks or months. You know, and sometimes we can't, we 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 just don't know. So it, it's a project that will never end. But what we try to do is to answer the WH questions. So so where is it? So that's the, the 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 location the coordinates the latitude longitude um who named it if we can find that out um uh what is it is it a mountain or a stream or a city or whatever uh when was it named and if possible why was it given that name so those WH questions will form the, the 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 biography of that of that name, that place name. So that's what we we attempt to do, and most of the time we can't answer all of those WH questions. We can always say this is where it is and that's what it is, but we don't know who named it, why it was named that. So, um, and that's particularly the case with Indigenous names, Aboriginal names. You know, even sometimes Aboriginal people don't know the meaning of, the, of, of a name. And, and uh, quite often it's, it's secret men's business and they will not tell you the, the meanings of, uh, uh, of or the origins of, of, of the, their place names. So, which is which is a shame, but I can understand that after the way they've been treated by Europeans, you know. Yeah. So, are, are there any questions from our students? No, they must they must be all very satisfied <laughs> or very shy. <laughs> so, if uh, there are no no questions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ian for this wonderful presentation and it's, uh, you have triggered so much in us and I'm sure also in our students' minds. Uh, it's just that maybe they are shy to uh, 
uh, and don't feel like uh, asking questions right now, but I'm sure That's they right. go through the video. And I'd like to, to thank our students uh, and in particular our association UNIDEA. We have a representative here, Simone Colella, and uh, President Gabriele Mancusi, who's uh, at the moment busy as well, I think, in the uh, uni our university library uh, because uh, they have offered their support for this initiative and uh, uh, the videos will be uploaded uh, on their YouTube uh, channel. And I'd also like to, to thank the American Main Society because uh, this has been possible thanks to uh, members of the American Name Society, such as yep. Ian and Dorothy Dodge Robbins, who was here before Christmas, and uh, Iman Nick, who, uh, our past past president, who's contributed so much to the development of the society. So thank you. And uh, Mirko, uh, if you want to add something, as uh, thank you to Mirko as well, because we have organized this thing together. Yes, maybe I, I, I would like to just thank you because actually the idea uh, came from you first and then we started talking about this and so we, we well, actually collaborated once again because we yes. we have a long history. So that, that's yes, we do. Nice. And uh, I think that, um, well, that, that was like the first, uh, um, yeah, cycle of, of seminars we are planning yeah, more I, I initiatives hope we'll be in the doing future. Something, yeah, this year as well, uh, which is good uh, for both uh, our society, our universities, mm -hmm. our relationship, our students. So yeah. that's good. And I'd I be think more than willing to. Important for, sorry. Pardon. No, no, I'd be more than willing to give another presentation on some more aspects of toponymy in, in the future, if you like. Thank you. That will be Thank great. That, that's great. That's great. Thank really you. a very precious contribution. Yeah, so. I can give some I can give some talks on some more theoretical aspects of mm -hmm. of, of toponyms. That's really fascinating. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. You're mm -hmm. most welcome. And thank you everyone for it for listening to me and, and attending this, this seminar. Really appreciate so, it. Uh, I'd just like to add happy new years. Happy New Year yes. to all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs> Peaceful, healthy, and, um, you know, an excellent year. Yep, yep. Have a good day, everyone. I'm about to uh, have a Good night, cup of tea. Ian. You yes, are on I'm the other about... side of the world. Good night. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's 10 to 10, and I'm about to uh, have a cup of tea and, and, and a biscuit and then might go to bed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Thank you. very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye, everyone. Bye. bye bye. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Simone. <laughs>